Elena Danan was a former archaeologist in France and in Egypt and has had some amazing contact experiences with a friendly group of human-looking extraterrestrials that are part of a galactic federation of worlds. She has been appointed an emissary to the galactic federation and recently has reported on meetings that she attended where the galactic federation has been recruiting a powerful insectoid species in this galactic-wide struggle against the Draconian Empire. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome, Elena, to Exopolitics Today. Thank you, Michael. Well, I really am fascinated by this uh, report that you put out earlier this week concerning this uh, insectoid species, the, the Negumak. So you want to just describe uh, this species? And I know you wrote about them in your 2021 book, and you, you had a description and you, you drew them. So how did you get to kind of like um, uh, draw them? Did, yeah, just tell us about how you found out about the, the Negumak. Well, when I was writing this book in 2021, A Gift from the Star, 2020, um, sorry, um, I, uh, I was writing about my abduction and my rescue by um, extraterrestrials. And the, the plan changed and I started to be given information about alien races visiting Earth and involving the affairs of Earth. And I was... Uh, communicating with uh, my contact in the Galactic Federation of Worlds, Thorhan Eredion, and we have a technology. We communicate via technology. I have an implant, which is a communicator, and he can. we can share images as well as sounds, voices, but also images. And he was sending me holographic images. I would close my eyes and relax and wait for the images. It would be kind of transparent, um, color images and I would then open my eyes and have a very short time to, to draw what I just saw and then spend time to make the, the drawing nice and that's how I got uh, all these images so that's the image of the, the Negumak that you uh, put into uh, a gift from the stars so that's something that uh, you you saw from Thorhan, and uh, so I mean that's a kind of pretty ferocious looking insectoid. So, uh, can you tell us anything about uh, what it was that was unique to that particular species? They are species on their own. And they come from the Scorpius constellation, from the star system Antares. Actually, the name of their world is Negumak. And the name of their culture is, is Gnomopo, but everybody says the, the Negumak. They are very, very tall. They measure about 20 feet high, enormous. Um, they are more, they are a species on, species on their own, but they are more insectoid. And uh, they, the particularity of these, this culture, these beings, is that they are the only beings in this galaxy um that can scare the draco reptilians the sikar the sikar are afraid of the negumak they are afraid only of the negumak and that's that's a very important information that everyone uh, is aware of uh yeah that is very important and um I'm, we're going to go into kind of more detail about this relationship between the neguma and the sakar but uh, when did uh, Earth's government first learn about the Negumak? I was told that they made contact in 1989 with Earth governments. Um, that's the information I, I got at the time in 2020. And, I mean, uh, did they learn that the Negumak were here and were involved in the abduction phenomenon? Were the Negumak doing abductions you know before 1989 or was it just after that and and can you, uh, do you know anything about the abductions 
Yeah, they were performing abductions and it stopped very quickly because for science uh, studies uh, of Earth, sci science studies, and the Galactic Federation asked them gently to stop doing this and they stopped and they went away. But they took contact with, with Earth and the thing is, you know, in 1989, it was full power of the, the, the cabal and the deep state and the reptilians behind them. And they, they didn't like the Negumak and they, they, were, they were scared of them because the Negumak, they are independent and they do not like the Draco. It, it's very interesting. They look very scary and they really <laughs> look scary, but they are very spiritual beings. It's really weird. It, we, we are not, uh, you know, we have been so much fed of ugly, scary aliens want to kill us and uh, good looking aliens want to save us. I mean, that's Hollywood. There are good looking aliens who want to kill us and there are ugly looking aliens who want to, to help us. Um, and the Negumak are, are on actually nice people. They, they do not, not have the spirit of conquest, which is lucky uh, for everyone. They are quite trying to, to be in peace with everyone. You know, and that, that's good. That's good. Yeah, very interesting that uh, the Negumak made contra contact in uh, 1989 with, with the governments uh, because soon after that there seemed to be um, an effort to kind of like depict the, the Negumak as a hostile. It's very interesting that in 1989 uh, there was a comic book series that began um, which, which was based on the idea of aliens versus predator. And and that that actually began in 1989. This comic book series, and you know, I find it very interesting that uh, you know because you, you mentioned Hollywood. Hollywood has been a tool for the deep state, working with the CIA to program people in a certain way. So if they want people to be frightened of a particular group of aliens. You know, they, they can use Hollywood to do that. And, and I, I think it's very interesting that in 1989, the same year when the Negumak made contact, you have this comic book series showing a struggle between two types of alien species. Uh, you know, one were the kind of aliens uh, from the kind of like alien franchise and another were, were the predators from the predator franchise. And the predators are, are like the uh, reptilians. And the uh, Negumak are like the aliens in the Predator versus Alien movies. Uh, and that, that all goes back to 1989. I, I find that very curious. So, again, yeah, this is an example of Hollywood uh, kind of like shaping people's uh, opinions. Yes, and I was, I was told when my, my book, A Gift from the Stars, uh, came out, very shortly after, people were messaging me saying, oh, my gosh, have you watched Independence Day? And I said, no, that's the same aliens, the Negumak. I went, wow. And I, I was very impressed. And then I, I start to think there's something there that's not right. The people who made this movie knew about these aliens for sure. And they, they turned them into um, regressive, dangerous aliens invading Earth. But I, I knew from my informations that they were nothing like this. The Negumak are actually uh, decent people, you know. So, yes, yeah, so Independence Day, that's another one, uh, another uh, sci-fi series, you know, like the Aliens versus Predator series, uh, the Independence Day series, I mean, that also depicts the insectoids as the enemies. And in, uh, I think it was the first one, 1996, you don't get to see the Queen but in the 2016 movie, you get to see the Queen. And um, if you look at the comparison of the drawing you did in, uh, in your A Gift from the Stars with the alien or with the alien kind of a queen, um, yeah, I mean, that, that is a very close match. And what's really interesting is that you haven't seen or Independence, Independence Day 1 or Independence Day. You haven't seen either of those movies, have you? No, I I, I actually, to be honest, I hate um, sci-fi movies that depict aliens as 
um, invaders and negative and all end of the world scenario. I never watch them. I, I'm I'm quite a Star Trek and Star Wars um, um, lover. I don't watch anything that that type. It's just depressing <laughs> or scary. <laughs> so uh, no, I I haven't seen them. Well, I think it's really amazing uh, the, the similarity. I mean, it's it's like uh, the I think it was Roland uh, Emmerich. He was the the director of the first Independence Day movie, uh, probably the second as well. And and he's a kind of a major Hollywood uh, director. And and here, I mean, the resemblance uh, between this uh, the alien. Queen in Independence Day 2 and the Negubak is so close that you, you can be sure. I, I mean, I would I would guess, and I would you know, bet on this that he was given a picture or a drawing, probably similar to your own, about the uh, Negubak and told, okay, you you got to make a movie where these guys look like ruthless killers here to wipe out humanity and they're genocidal. And you've got to instill fear in humanity against these, and um, and to me that that you know the fact that you drew this and you hadn't seen the Independence Day movies, you got the clear image of the Negumak from the Galactic Federation from Thorhan, and then we see the comparison between what you received and the Negumak, uh, yeah. what you received and the Alien Queen in Independence Day Two. The, you know, the match is like, okay, this is not coincidental. It's like someone in Hollywood, Roland Emmerich, was given this this image or picture and said, you you got to make this movie or you, you got to show these beings to be very hostile, very aggressive and genocidal. Yeah, because the, the, the picture I get, uh, Thorhan was sending me the, 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 ima the holographic images of the aliens uh, from the, um, the Federation database. So... I suppose if someone got images from there as well, um, or maybe there are um, universal pictures of every race that are like the standard and they are like in every organizations, maybe. I don't know about that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you say it's a queen. So um, the, um, the Negu Mike I, I saw because I met one uh, later, we're going to talk about that. Uh, he looked exactly like this, uh, but it wasn't a queen. It was just a, a, a representative, and there was a masculine energy coming from him. So uh, that's interesting as well. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, so it's, mm. uh, it's rather than a queen, we're, we're talking about androgynous or a masculine energy coming from at least some of the some of the negumark. Um, okay, mm. so I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Hollywood was part of a, some kind of uh, psyop to instill fear in the population against this species that um, is a kind of like an enemy of the deep state or of the uh, Draco reptilian. And, and I think it's very significant uh, that, uh, you know, we understand that Hollywood plays this role, that, that Hollywood has for 70 years now been putting out movies, trying to condition uh, the, the global public as well as the American public to think in a certain way about aliens. So the fact that they went to this effort to depict that particular species in this very hostile, aggressive way uh, tells you something about the motivation um, because, I mean, you, you said that Thorhan... So why don't you just describe... You know the conditions where you first saw them, and and what, you know, why you feel that they're positive race as opposed to a negative race. Um, you're referring to uh, what I witnessed a few days ago. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the Negumak were uh, requested um, in 2021 the Galactic Federation of Worlds in the midst of the end of the war with the, the deep state, the, not the deep state, but the Draco extraterrestrial part of the deep state and the greys, um, especially the Draco. We were expulsing the Dracos out of the star system in 2000, 2021 from Mars, from uh, other places, from Earth as well. There was a big war in the undergrounds, etc. Um, 
to put all the chances <coughs> sorry, on their side, the Federation asked uh, the Negumak uh, if they would uh, bother uh, coming and just be there at the edge of the star system and scare the Dracos. <laughs> And uh, they accepted. They came, and they they never had to intervene, which is is very good because they it's they're a bit uh, frightening. So they stay there, and they're still there. They are still there as long as Earth is not sorted out with the deep state and the cabal, with the human cabal. Now, um, recently, uh, so the Sikar or the Draco reptilians, they've been chased out of the star system. They are very, very angry about that, to have lost Earth and the soul system. So they are trying, they, they have been trying to get back in, but they cannot because you have the, the, the Galactic Federation and you have also the Intergalactic Confederation or the, the Cedars is part, is a group part of them, who are I mean, they are, there are 500 motherships in this star system around Jupiter, and there are even more around the star system outside of the plasma shield. So uh, it's a lot. You know, the Intergalactic Confederation, they do not um, bother with numbers. It's fr they are an organization with many galaxies, so the numbers, they don't count. When they move fleets, it's a lot of ships. And so... The, the Draco were trying to nag, were nagging the, the, the Negumak to, 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 to starting to provoke them to get them out, to get back into and just want, they wanted maybe to attack <laughs> the Intergalactic Confederation, which is stupid. Anyway, so the Negumak was, were just tired of that because they have a limited amount of patience, I discovered. Um, and so, Instead of attacking the Draco, that tells you about them. They could have straight away answered to the provocation and attacked back the Draco, but it didn't do that. They tried to get a way to make peace with them and calm them down. So that tells you who they are. They could have wiped them out like this, and they're not looking for that. That's very interesting. So they request the, the Federation to have access to um, the uh, genetic frequency database of the Federation concerning Earth. Why that? So a ship was allowed to come into our star system, a Negumak ship, a small ship carrying Negumak, and meet with the, the, the Federation. So they were uh, in the star system waiting for a meeting. Why did they want this? Uh, have access to this database? It's because they were looking to take hostages, Sikar hybrid hostages, important hostages, that they could trade with the Sikar to get them to go away. So the, the Federation, uh, I was given notice that there would be this meeting and if I wanted to come as a reporter. So I was very excited about that. So that happened on the 19th uh, of uh, April, 2023. I was beamed on board the Excelsior and from there, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I was, uh, so I was, it's the first time it happens to me. I was given gloves, uh, very, very strange, dark blue gloves. And these gloves are technology. And this technology, um, so it works on the DNA as well. You put, so I was invited to put my hands on pads on a circular table. There was an, um, like inclinated, uh, field like this, and I would put, put, we would put our hands on it, and there was the whole high command of the the Excelsior. And we, I was told, uh, we will not do a holographic projection as normally the meetings do, because the Negumak don't do holographic projections. They want people physically. They are very straight and simple pe people. They really they want things normal. Um, and so we would bilocate. I had never done that that way, at, at least. Um, never. It, it was really impressive. That means I was going to be split in two. It was really weird. I never done that. So um, I, my, a version of me would stay on the ship with the hands on the, the, the pads, and I would be doubled 
teleported to a location where the meeting was taking place and it was physical. So at any moment, we could relocate to the ship if something was going bad. It was very interesting technology. Uh, it felt like teleportation, felt exactly the same. So there were rep three representatives of the Intergalactic Confederation, the Cedars. Uh, there were um, Ardana and um, Commander, uh, High Commander Denethor, they were there as well. So I was asked to remain in my seat. It was stone seat. It was in a cave. Um, and there was a, a, like a curtain of white, thick, grayish, thick mist in front of us. The cave was huge and it was freezing cold. So I was invited to adjust my body temperature by putting a hand on my um, biometric belt. And that adjusts the temperature for me. And, um, <coughs> sorry, that, <laughs> how to describe that? I wasn't, I was expecting it, but at the same time, I wasn't. They had, the Negumak were there, came through the mist. It was apparently something environmental to them that they could breathe and be in their mist. That was their, their environment. The meeting was, I was told, it was taking place on one of the moon of Uranus, um, Ariel, because it had a carbon dioxide atmosphere. And so the Negumak arrived and one, I, I could see the, the front part of one and it came out of the mist. It was very scary. I was so scared. I had a shock. It was huge. And the head coming first and then the, the clothes, and I could hear tick, 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 tick. It was like a giant spider with um, met metallic, I don't know, hard clothes at the end of it. It was hitting the rock, and there were, t I could see thick um, olive green tentacles in his, his, his back, browsing the mist, and he had, so he had a crest behind his neck, and it was like a dragon, and Something I cannot describe by writing. I can just do it. <laughs> the, the crest was moving like... <laughs> like this. It was very scary. Very scary. With the, that kind of sound that of the, the, the kind of the, the, the leather or the skin moving. And um, every time he moved, that was doing that. So... Um, there, uh, telepathic communication engaged between himself and Commander Ardana, and I was really scared. I, I, I just took my, put my, <laughs> my knees against me, and I was, I, I even had tears in my eyes because of the shock. It, it was super scary. But then Thoran calmed me down. He said, "Hey, they're nice. They're impressive, but they're nice. Calm down." Um. So the tr the communication was translated by Thoran to me. Uh, it was, they told the Negumak that uh, they cannot have access to the genetic database of the Federation because they are not members. So the Federation has been trying very hard to get the Negumak in for a, a long time because once they're in, it's, it's, it's really good, you know, uh, to have them. Um, so it was... They hoped there were two members of the High Council as well of the Federation who were there physically, and they were hoping to kind of make a bargain. Um, they said, "We we are um, not giving you hostages. Earth, we are taking care of Earth. You have nothing to do with that. You're not a member of the Federation. But what we can do is remove four of these Sikar hybrids." And keep them on the Excelsior, the battleship. They don't say Excelsior, they say the battleship. Um, and when I say Excelsior, it's the, the humans uh, call this ship like this. They don't call it like this, they, they call it the battle station. Okay, so we, we take these, um, these humans, these four hybrids, as hostages in, cell, in a jail on the, ex the Excelsior, on the battle station, and um, for you. And that's the deal. Otherwise, if you want them, you come, you become member. So the Negumak wasn't happy at all. He wasn't happy at all. And he was pacing the, the cave right to left. And he, 
moving his crest and ticking the ground and boom, 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 boom. It was, I swear, I, I, I was terrified. Even if I knew I was sure that I risked nothing, it was fine. And even if something went um, wrong, we could relocate instantly. But it was impressive, impressive. So um, he, was, he wasn't happy with that. So the lady, there was a lady from the High Council, she was there, an Osman lady, it's a race, a uh, human race, they are tall, they have, they are bold, tall. She's the law keeper of the High Council and she's in charge of uh, keeping the Prime Directive uh, documents. So she had a copy document of the Prime Directive and it's a holo, it was a holosphere, sphere, it's, it's big like this, holographic sphere, blue with a bit of gold, and it was in data, holosphere, document. That's how they store the documents. And she gave it to the, to the Negumak and she said, uh, she held it towards him and she said, well, uh, that's our conditions. And if you want to, however, if you, however, one day wants to join the Federation, here's our prime directives. And with this document, there are all our laws, study them, and think about it. And he he took it in his in his in his hand, and then um, he withdrew. They all made. There were other negumaks behind. I could maybe hear two of them. I don't know if there were more in the mist. I couldn't see them. They withdrew. They stepped back and making a sound like a, um. Not, not ohm, but ah, uh, kind of <laughs> very, very low sound. And it was their way of salu salutation to say goodbye. It was quite impressive. And then we were beamed on board the, the ship. So, um, yeah, I was still uh, shaking and I've been shaking <laughs> the following day. On the 28th, they gave their answer. So I was uh, invited by uh, Ardana, High Commander Ardana, on the battle station, the Excelsior, to uh, look at a holographic projection that was broadcast to all the diplomatic stations in the whole galaxy, where the Negumak, one of the Negumak leaders, uh, an important one anyway, was giving his answer, saying that the Negumak will not uh, become members, enter membership with the Galactic Federation of Worlds, in the, on the condition of a bargain. They like our laws, they like the prime directive, they like our ethics, but so they, they are considering and they are okay, they are considering entering as members and it will be on their terms and when they want. So it's good because as Ardana said, it shows that they have ethics and honor and that's good. Um, and so what's going to happen is that these four hostages are going to be in custody of the Federation and see what happens. So I just wanted to kind of uh, people that might not know that that information you put out in a video update and also you, you wrote about it and people can just go uh, to your website, LeonardDenar.org, to get the update, the both the uh, video with the, the graphics of things that you described and of the uh, the written version or the report that you did of that. So, you know, people can go there to get the details of that. Um, I, I thought it was an amazing report, and uh, yeah, but the implications are, are really very important for us as a species because, you know, people watching this, uh, you know, we're, we're totally fixated on the idea of disclosure, deep state covering up the truth about an extraterrestrial presence. Very few of us are really prepared for all of a sudden uh, being thrust into this dilemma in terms of, uh, of a galactic war that involves these ancient species, uh, the Draco reptilians on the one side, and then you have the uh, the uh, Negumak on the other side, and and of course 
uh, you know, the, we, we have depictions of that ancient war going uh, some time. I mean, of course, you, you have the movies, uh, you, you have Alien versus Predator. And for those that have watched the Alien versus Predator movie uh, franchise, the first one depicted them as, as fighting, um, that this was an ancient war being fought by these species. And it took place in a pyramid in Antarctica, under the Antarctic ice, showing that this was an ancient war and there was uh, murals depicting uh, the, the kind of extent of this ancient battle. And uh, I found it very interesting in also that in the Sasquatch message to humanity, uh, Sunbo True Brother, who I guess channeled that work or co-wrote that work with the Sasquatch, the, the Sasquatch described, first there was an insectoid species and and the, that what followed them was a reptilian species and that the insectoid and the reptilians fought against one another. There was a war between them. And it, so it, and this was way before uh, the creation of, of uh, human humans, according to the Sasquatch met, message. So, so it says that this war, between the, the insectoids and the Draco reptilians goes back many millions of years. And, and what I found to be really interesting was that uh, there was a lecture that Dr. Sam Osmanagic gave. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's the archaeologist behind the, the Bosnian pyramids. And, <gasps> and he says that he found artwork in a number of pyramids that show this ancient battle between an insectoid species and a Draco reptilian species uh, that goes back millennia. So there you have, you know, it's not just Hollywood putting out this information about the Draco and the, uh, and the Negumak. Um, it, you find elements of it in the Sasquatch message to humanity, but also Dr. Sam Osmanovic has found artwork in the Bosnian pyramid and other pyramids around the world that show this ancient battle between the insectoids and the predator species, or so the insectoids wow. and the reptilians. So, yeah, I just wanted to get your reaction to that. Wow. So yes, that that's why the the Sikara are afraid of them because they know how what the Negumaks are able capable to uh, of. Um, I didn't know about that. <laughs> that 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 could really really well be because the only species, the only uh, insectoid species who could fight at equal, at least equality equality the the Sikara reptilians would be the Negumak. Because no other insectoid species is is strong enough to face them, you know, only the negumak and the negumak are stronger. Mm -hmm. I that's suppose very, they won this ancient war. <laughs> that, that's very interesting what you said because I know that a, a lot of a lot of people uh, describe the the praying mantis insectoids no. as kind of like working with or. Um, sometimes being allied with the Draco reptilians, mm. and you know, people have described the praying mantis insectoids being there with the tall greys or with the Nebu, and that they're all part of this kind of Draco Orion deep state alliance. That the insect, that the praying mantis are being a part of that, but the Negumaka, as you said, a completely different species. Oh yeah, that had nothing to do with the mantids. Mantids come uh, are a species that uh, that was spread in our galaxy from the Sombrero Galaxy, and they 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 are they like to be scientists and just do experiments, and they have they don't have the same ethics as everyone else, so they don't care for which side they work, and the the, the Orion Empire has enslaved many of them. Uh, so but that has nothing to do with the Negumak. Oh no no, the Negumak are from this galaxy. They are from Antares star system, and they're really local to this galaxy. And there's nothing to do. They are 20 feet high, at least. You know, there's nothing to do with the mantis. Totally different it is. Right. So that, that really kind of leads to the big question here in terms of like, okay, so, you know, 
disclosure is, is much more than just finding out that extraterrestrials are real and the government has been hiding them from us. It's like waking up to the fact that, you know, there is a big galactic history that we don't know about and that these different sides have been warring against each other. And now um, it sounds as though, you know, from your report that this galactic war is going to go hot at some point, that that the Galactic Federation, along with this intergalactic confederation, are trying to recruit the Negumak because the goal is to kind of like wipe out or to reduce the Sakaar influence in our galaxy. So, yeah, that's a that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, the so Sikar have been growing and growing and really annoying everyone, and they are at the origin of the Dark Fleet. So, and very much involved in the Dark Fleet. So, we think that in this uh, last war, the Dark Fleet will will be on the side of the the, the Sikar Empire. Uh, I have I need to remember we chased we kicked out the 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 Dark Fleet faction that was in our star system, but we didn't. Uh, kick the whole dark fleet, you know, the Nachtwaffen. They they still have their um, their not empire, but their you know the strong organization, and uh, so they still they uh, they will ally the the Sikar, But you know, they they may be very uh, powerful. They are not as powerful as the Negumak, the Galactic Federation of Worlds, the Intergalactic Confederation, and there's another army who has offered to join. And the full fleet, the full armada, it's the Anach um, armada, the Anach forces. Who are the Anach or the Anachim? It's the Anunnaki. Ia assured, assured when, when the Negumak gave, uh, uh, I was told this by Ardana, uh, when the Negumak gave the answer that they will join, but when they want, um, Ia straight away uh, visited um, the federation, uh, he, he went on the Excelsior actually, and he said that, okay, I'm giving the, f I know where this is going, I am giving uh, the full armada of the Anak Empire if uh, this kicks up, kicks out. So, um, and it will, and the thing is, the, the Sikar Empire has no chance. Mm. No chance. <laughs> Absolutely no chance. Uh, this is too strong against them, too strong. And uh, Ardana told me, you know, um, it's going to be more of a clearing than a war. Um, you know, it's going to be like everybody saying, now stop, that's enough. Uh, now that they can, now that the, the Negumak joining, um, you know. So we, it's inevitable, as I was said, but it's not for now. It's building up, but it's now to not for now. We have time. Uh, we never know when that can blow up, but um, it will be over very quickly. Uh, and uh, yeah. Of course, in the meantime, uh, humanity is going to go through this incredible awakening and disclosure uh, where the truth is going to come out. All, the, all this hidden history will come out all, and the, the, the kind of like creation of the Dark Fleet, you know, how they worked with the uh, Deep State and with the Sakaar and did all these horrible things outside of our solar system. Uh, and, and, and they are still here. They have a presence. They have a foothold because they are humans. So they're, they're our problem, not the Galactic Federation's problem. And so mm -hmm. we have to deal with them. But, uh, but on the other hand, we, we know... Um, from different sources that, you know, the White Hats or the Positive Earth military have been working with the Galactic Federation for for some time, for many decades. I mean, uh, William Tompkins, uh, who was um, one of the key people in creating the U.S. Navy's secret space program, I mean, he talked about the Navy working with the Nordics going back to the 1950s. So, so this has been happening for a long time, and that, and he said up front that the Navy was working with Nordics, and the Nordics were helping uh, the Navy build um, new fleets um, in the Nordic spaceports in in other uh, in another solar system because Earth had become so compromised. So you know, so there that kind of like corroborates what you've been saying that uh, that the Earth Alliance uh, Space Command 
uh, are kind of like collaborating with the Galactic Federation, that that's, that, that, uh, that is real. Um, but of course, once humanity wakes up and learns the truth, uh, you know, we don't know when, but it sounds like it will happen that there will be uh, a confrontation with the Sakaar because, as you said, you know, they're, they're angry, they are wanting to come back. For them, it's a matter of pride that they lost control yes. of our solar system. And so at some point, they're going to come back and it's better for humanity to be kind of allied or be a part of the Galactic Federation as opposed to like just... Um, you know, allowing the Sakaar to come back and we're on our own and we have no means of defending ourselves because we're still a fairly young species. Yes, and uh, after the Jupiter Accords in um, July 2021, uh, Thoron said to me to a question I, I, I asked him, um, I said, why are you um, hiring these CEOs such as Elon Musk and Bezos and the others? Uh, to build ships and to build technologies. And he said, because we do not have time to train new ones and, and it's new uh, factories. They are here. We're going to use them. And I say, no time. He said, we, w he said something like we are running out of time and we need to, we, we have no time. We, we, we need to be quick. And what I uh, tried to ask more questions, and he said, "No, there's no uh, no solar event, no catastrophic things. It's just political um, and diplomatic uh, reasons." And I didn't know more. And now it make it makes sense to me that humanity needs to really make an effort to uh, get on together, fight the right enemy, which are humans on Earth at, in, the, in the cabal, and you know which ones, uh, and. Um, and then once we, we, we unite together, we can have a, make the step forward and join the Federation and being, uh, you know, ready to, uh, to defend ourselves with, as members of the Federation. Because once in, uh, the Federation can really help us militarily, openly, because we are in and we are not subject anymore to the Prime Directive. So they can really do whatever they want. They can send fleets open day and kill the bodies you know as long as we are not in the federation they cannot do that so we we need to um to just move forward and just you know everything stop being fearful and etc cetera, etc cetera. well that's very important uh, what you mentioned about the jupiter accords and of course uh the way you described it initially uh, was that there were 14 uh, nations represented at the Jupiter Accords and six of those nations were part of an executive council that were formed to kind of like manage space affairs on behalf of the Earth. And, uh, and the United States Space Command was chosen as kind of like the lead or the chairman of that executive council. But, of course, you, you mentioned that Russia and China weren't very happy with the arrangement, uh, but nevertheless, you know, that, that was the condition that the Galactic Federation uh, set for uh, Earth joining the Galactic Federation, that we have to speak as a unified voice and that this ex executive council and this uh, leadership by U.S. Space Command would, would, be the, would be the key for that. So as we step forward and, and become a member of the Galactic Federation, um, you know, is... I mean, how strong is this kind of like unity between the major nations or is it paper thin? Because on the one hand, you know, you look at the world around us now, you know, under this Biden administration here, it's like you know, they're, they're trying to push the United States into a war with Russia over Ukraine. They're trying to get the U.S. involved in a war with uh, China. But behind the scenes, uh, you know, my source, I mean, JP and other sources are saying that, you know, there's the white hats are collaborating. That they that they there's a lot of unity between them. So so you know, is this kind of disunity or chaos on planet Earth really just a show? That really behind the scenes, humanity is is kind of a, as unified as it can be, and that we are on board and and we are there sh shouldn't be any problem with us joining the Galactic Federation. Yes, I I I think there's what we see and what's behind the scenes. Um, after the Jupiter Accord, two ships left the, the, the Accords uh, 
Jupiter, it was a Russian ship, well, two ships of Solar Warden carrying a Russian delegation and a Chinese delegation. And, um, but they were still part of the whole, just they were not in the, the lead six uh, countries who were leading the, the, the Space Federation of Earth. Um, but China and Russia were still part of the whole thing, just not in the leader group. That's, but they're still part of it. So that's that's something you know we need to keep in mind. Um, China is, is true that they they try to be a little bit competitive and independent, but they are still part of the the, the whole federation. So I think it's a, a matter of everyone being on the same frequency, of, you know. Um, that but that yeah that's we are joining the federation. We are we become member of the federation. And that is something that is going to happen. And it is going to be smooth and easy because uh, once we've gotten rid of the deep state, we have everything to, to gain from the, the, the Federation. We are sharing technology, we are uh, sharing science, and we, we protect each other with no prime directive, nothing anymore. We, are, we just openly protect each other. And for Earth, it's it's we're going to be untouchable, 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 because the the, the empire, like the Nebu, never attacked a, a world that was part of the Federation that would straight away start a war. Uh, the Sikar have never done it as as well. So once we're in, we're protected. You know, we are defended and protected. And uh, all these enforcements of the the Intergalactic Confederation that have are back into this galaxy and they are having a close hand on the things, you know, nothing can happen. Nothing can happen anymore to the soul system. We are so much protected. And the and the Dianak, the Anunnaki Empire just joins the fun. So I mean, wow, we're, we're gonna be fine. We're gonna be fine. And while all of all of this happens uh at the edge of the, the star system, the humanity of Earth is going to spread out into the star system and raise in awareness, in consciousness, in frequency, and build a beautiful new future. And those who will want to go and fight uh, the, the Sikar, well, they, they will be welcome, but will not be obliged. Uh, I, I'm still studying um, the, the, all the, the, the politics of different worlds part of the Federation, and I am discovering that uh, when you enter the federation, you you think you could think, oh, now they've they've helped us. We we have we owe them to help them and enroll in their wars. Uh, but no, we are not obliged. We do it if we want, if we want to. It's always the same free will, basic uh, thing with with the federation. Nobody is obliged of anything. Okay, so once this kind of like show is over, once uh, the deep state is defeated, and you know that it, that still can be a matter of uh, weeks, months. We don't know when. Uh, I mean, hopefully, it's not going to last too much longer. Uh, but once that happens, then the true history is revealed. People will learn about the different races, what they've done here, and people will feel much more comfortable about being with the Galactic Federation, you know, because I'm sure people, you know, there, there will be some that will be pretty shocked when they learn about the the, the Negumak and and uh, it's like, whoa, you, you, you want to be allies with, with that group? and But then again, you know, there are the, the Sakars that have been part of this oppressive system. So, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? <laughs> yes, right, absolutely, absolutely. And um, yes, we we have to learn about diversity, and um, yes, that's going to be um, you know that's we're going to be good. We're going to be good. Mm. Well, just to kind of shift gears a little bit, I, I know um, actually the one of the reasons we actually got to uh, meet originally and talk was because of a super soldier from Singapore. Chow and you talked to him and got to interview him a few times and uh, you know we put his material or you put his material out I I, I kind of helped uh, get that material out there and he described how as a super soldier he was trained to fight against the Sakaar 
so that was that was fascinating and you know there was other people who had come forward saying the same thing that there were a lot of super soldiers that uh, were being trained to fight the Sakaar. so you know these predator movies are based on fact that yeah i mean it's not just the the aliens or the kind of like uh, uh, negumak that have been fighting the Sakaar, that uh, um, human super soldiers have been trained so you just finished a book about your conversations with Stephen. So you want to tell us about that and when, when it's going to come out? Yes, Michael, thank you. Yes, I I, I published on YouTube a video of my interview of Stephen uh, where he tells about, a bit about his life and about his time at Area 51. But there's more than that. There are email conversations, Zoom calls, and we were we've been talking about Area 51 and sharing our information about aliens. And I am making all of this public, of course, the transcript of, of the, the video, but also all my conversations with Stephen, which are rich with so much information. So the I made a I'm publishing a book about all these conversations and um corroborations as well of what he says. And I I'm I'm publishing this book on the first of June 2023, and uh, you can pre-order. You're going to be able to pre-order the, um, the the Kindle in the meantime. Uh, that Stephen wanted to be interviewed by you, even though he knew it yes. was dangerous for him, that he was warned against it, that he was told <laughs> if, if he was going to be interviewed, go public, that uh, his life was threatened. And, I mean, I think after, he, after your interview went public, I mean, uh, he died. I mean, you, you yes. want to talk a little bit about that? Well, actually, uh, w w yeah, um, we were communicating and by email and Zoom conversations and never at any moment it was a question of doing a video because to me it was un unthinkable, you know, <laughs> um, for him. And one day I, I, started to, I stopped having uh, news from him. I, I didn't hear about him for a month or two. Uh, and I start to worry. And then suddenly he wrote back to me and the tone was very different. You, you'll see in my book, there's like the emails are very long. We chat a lot. But that was like four lines, three lines. And he was in a hurry. And he said, this is first email back. The, it was, um, you have a YouTube channel. Uh, can, can, uh, I'm, uh, can we do an interview? I'm ready to speak. I was shocked, uh, and I answer, are you sure? Because, you know, uh, I don't want you to get any trouble. And um, he didn't reply. He said, yes, yeah, schedule me an appointment. And I said, are you sure? And uh, he wasn't reply. And, um, and so he insisted, insisted, and said, okay, let's do it. But at uh, any moment, I can take it down or change your mind. Oh, it's fine. So um, I edited the video, but I was feeling a bit embarrassed, you know, because um, he's, he's risking a lot with that. And, uh, and he rushed me to put it. And the last uh, email he, before the video was aired, he said it was r written in capital. Put it out, please. I, and he write, I'm bleeding. I have blackouts and I'm bleeding. Wow. So I put it out. And telling him, okay, I can, you tell, I take it down whenever you want. And, he, he, yeah, he died four days later. So it sounds as though he was under attack, that, that he was talking to you, giving you information, telling you about the super soldier program, uh, the involvement mm -hmm. of high-level officials in Singapore. Uh, yeah. he, he was he was uh, taken to Area 51. He, he was observing uh, how things were conducted there and he talked about some of the craft and the scientists mm. involved in this and um and so he he knew that um his time was short because he was talking to you and um yeah it sounds like you know what what you what you were able to record of your conversations and the emails and the final interview really was uh his final will and testament to humanity like he's a hero <laughs> to humanity for you know, for wanting this to go out, and and and, and he felt compelled to do it. 
Yes, and it, it, I, 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 I felt guilty for a while until I was told that no, he wanted, it's a gift. He knew you were protected, and he, you helped him giving his uh, testament, you know, his, his legacy to humanity, and it's an honor. It chose you. Uh, I went, wow, uh, yeah. So um, he, so he, 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 he was interacting with me because I knew stuff about aliens and. It, he said that it was corroborating his experience, so he, he just wanted to share, and I was so happy to share with him. But then, yeah, he died. He, he was under attack. So um, he said that um, bef before, in in the in the the moment, yes, in the I knew I knew that after when he, I didn't have news from him that these two months. Apparently, he received threats from an organization, and he wasn't the only one. Other employees of Area 51 had received harsh, severe threats not to come forward and not to talk. And then he, he emailed me again, and he said, I want to talk. I want to speak. I want to speak now. And he was really determined well i think he's a very brave person and uh i think he finished life uh in, in a way that uh is you know really good for him i mean it's i think that was his sole mission to kind of like have these experiences and to tell humanity share that and uh that that was wonderful that you helped him that you facilitated that so the book uh, when is it going to be released and can people pre-order it uh, I am going to uh, put the, the pre-order on the eighth of of um, sorry eighth of May, and it will be they can start to pre-order, and then on the first of June uh, the paperback will come. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we'll we'll have links for people that want to order that book, but uh, June first um, it'll be released. So I wanted to now kind of shift to another topic, which is very. Uh, topical at the moment, which is uh, a lot of these orb sightings that are happening all around the world. Um, and, you know, there, there's been a lot of speculation as to where these come from. So uh, I just wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about the, the Cedar ships, because I know you talked about, I think it was four Cedar ships that you fleet and were approaching the earth and were going to park around the earth and and do things. So um, uh, were there four? Are there more? Are they releasing probes? Are they releasing orbs? You want to tell us? Yes. Um, the, the Intergalactic Confederation who were, that arrived in October 2021 in our star system, they were they are 500 motherships near in the vicinity of Jupiter. They parked a little bit a few months later in 2022, they brought four motherships in orbit of Earth. They are cloaked, you can't see them. And that's when uh, a disclosure plan was started with the Intergalactic Confederation that they would also show their, show their ships uh, more often in the Earth atmosphere to start to get people used to see scout ships and, you know, flying saucers, etc., to prepare the disclosure. Uh, recently, uh, a few months ago, not not very far from now, uh, two more ships of the Federation of the the Intergalactic Confederation, sh sorry, arrived in the orbit of Earth. Two more mother ships. So now there are six Intergalactic Confederation mother ships in the orbit of Earth, cloaked, because the disclosure plan moved forward start of 2023 um it was it's very recent um probably in march um i think they arrived the the orb starts to to be released at that same time the intergalactic alteration uses uh, this kind of technology these are probes so the the galactic federation of worlds uses probes as little flying saucers or little metallic um, ships 
the intergalactic confederation who are more advanced in technology, they use plas plasma orbs and they are like um, remote viewing cameras. They are like cameras. That means they have technology in their ship and they send the orbs and they're like flying cameras and they see that on the screen. But not only cameras, they can record um, frequency sig signature, um, any type of things, any type of data. So they are roaming the earth, they, they are sending orbs to uh, seek for particular humans. Uh, particular humans who uh, are meant to play a role in the disclosure and especially with the ARCs. These humans have special DNA frequencies. They have um, the, the, the DNA cocktail <laughs> necessary to activate, to work the technology. So they are gathering these, they're not gathering them, they they spotting them um, because these humans have the, the cedars, some of the cedars um, genetics, so they can work the technology of the ARCs, some of the ARCs. That's interesting. Uh yeah, I, I remember the interview. Uh, we had both interviewed this French contactee, Robert L, and he yes. talked about the the orbs that, yes. that that he had an experience of sighting, and that they had this function. and And when he was at the base in the Himalayas, that he was able to see how they operated. So, you want to? Yeah. Do you remember that incident? Maybe you want to describe it. Robert L, yes, he's a French contactee. He's in his seventies now. Uh, yes, we both uh, had a chat with him and you 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 made a, a video report about him and an article, I remember. Um, he, he spent one year in a base of the Intergalactic Confederation with actually the Altians in the Himalayas. And they had this orb technologies. Yes, uh, before the, the, we know now, we had conversation with uh, Robert, uh, we, we know it's the Altians. Uh, before they contacted him in his farm in a remote, rural, s French southwest, they were sending these orbs around the farm, on the roads, to study. They were picking the right DNA. And this is exactly what they're doing now, Michael. It's right. They were uh, roaming for, um, browsing and scanning for uh, the right DNA. That's, what, that's, why, that's how they picked Robert. That's it. That's the same thing. Um, and, um, they, uh, so they picked him to, uh, they offered him to come for uh, a year in this base, uh, in the Himalayas to give his, um, seamen <laughs> for, uh, helping populate other worlds. And that's exactly what the seeders do. And, um, he, he had quite an interesting time there. And there was these orbs. I, I, I'm at, at one moment in the base. On the table, there's this monitor, and he sees his house, and they tell him that there's an orb there that trans transmits the, the 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 image, the pictures from France. Um, yeah, well done. Yes. Yes, yeah, so, uh, very interesting. Uh, JP also said that uh, that the arcs are releasing orbs to kind of like. Uh, gauge or measure th their planet's population. So what do you think is happening with the orbs that are being released by the ARCs? Or do you know anything about that? I think the ARCs, um, I was told about this ge uh, frequency genetic scanning. Um, I think the ARCs are about to be revealed. They had, they, they, they plan to, to show them, start to get them fly, but they're, the deep state is just fighting teeth and nail to just, you know, they won't let it go. So it's taking time, postponing things, but eventually the arcs will show themselves and there will be humans able to use this technology. And there are apparently a lot of humans. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the only thing I know for the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember... Uh, I asked uh, Alex Collier about the um, orbs being released by the ARCs, you know, because JP said that the ARCs are releasing these orbs and they're going around and, and there's just an increase in them and that, and that the military is concerned about that or is aware of that. And so Alex thought that the orbs were looking for the crew of the ARCs. What do you think of that? 
yeah, yeah, that that totally goes into the same um, idea of uh, r looking for the, the people who are able to to work this technology. Of course, yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know that takes me to um, this kind of development that you, you actually have the new head of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which was uh, created last year to monitor UFO reports and to give uh, regular reports or annual reports to Congress, to the US Congress, about UFO sightings in the US. And, and now, you know, in their most recent report, they describe, well, you know, now they're, they're monitoring 650 UFO cases. And, you know, while they can explain some, many they can't they can't explain. And so they're saying these are real UFOs, but they're saying that, that you know, they don't know what they are. You know, the, the head of that office, uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, he co-wrote a paper with this uh, professor from Harvard University, Avi Loeb, who's the head of the Galileo Project, searching for techno signatures, um, you know, somewhere in our, in our galaxy, that they wrote a paper saying that a mothership may be behind the UFO phenomena, that a mothership is releasing these probes. So what do you think of that? Do you, do you think this is uh, an example of, of the deep state trying to get trying to get ahead of the story or is it preparing us for for what's for what's to come down? So there, there you have the story in Politico. Well, there are two things. There are really two uh, motherships of the Intergalactic Confederation who came in the orbit of Earth to perform this task of, of releasing orbs. That's a fact. But uh, the deep state could as well, they, they, they do that very well, um, take advantage of a situation and turn them into their advantage by saying, oh, there's all these orbs around and let, let us bring our own narrative first to say something, you know, to explain it at our advantage and then use it to, why not the alien invasion scenario? We never know what they have in, in store. Right, it does seem that it's more coincident, more than coincidental, that they come up with this mothership releasing probes or orbs explanation at the same time as, as you said, that uh, you have like now six motherships from the uh, from the intergalactic confederation around the Earth releasing probes. It's like they're, they're getting the public ready uh, for this, and uh, you know, I, I guess. You know, the question is, is this a deep state operation or is this a white hat operation? I, I, I know that uh, Thorhan gave this disclosure plan uh, back in January to uh, the four-star general that's, that runs uh, Northern Command in the United States, uh, General Glenn Van Herc. He gave him this disclosure plan. So do, do you think this is, this is part of the disclosure plan, you know, this, this paper um, or... The, the the galactic feder the intergalactic confederation motherships coming here and releasing orbs is that part of the plan? It can very well be part of the plan. I don't have the 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 information, but knowing them, you know, we are dealing with um, highly intelligent organizations, and they each. Each, each part is trying to play the other using, mar using martial arts techniques. So it's very intricate. You never know who does what. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, there's a disclosure plan. And this disclosure plan is very well done. And it will surprise the deep state at the last moment. And uh, so it's very, very secret. That's why it was given hand in hand. And, uh, you know, Michael, even if I knew the whereabouts i wouldn't even be able to to tell because i would just mess it up <laughs> you know okay. so um there there is a plan that is unfolding it's very very well done very well done so let's see what happens yes yes well uh, i know there's a lot of things going on now there's there's a few people that are putting out different scenarios about uh, what's going to happen, and I think this is all predicated on you know what we've been yeah. discussing. That you know the motherships are here; uh, they're orbiting the Earth. They're releasing probes. You've got the the space arcs that are buried that are starting to release probes, and they're starting to to kind of like uh, activate, and they're going to 
be floating soon. So, so you know that leads to what is the deep, how is the deep state going to react? Because even though the you know this is again something we need to emphasize that even though the the negative extraterrestrials, the Sakar, the Draco, the Nebu have had to leave our solar system, uh, the deep state still has a lot of assets, a lot of uh, power. So how are they going to spin all of this? And and so that leads to, is there going to be a fake alien invasion? You know, there are some people that, that say there's going to be a real alien invasion. And, you know, one of my former uh associates uh randy kramer is putting out information that there's going to be a real alien invasion and i don't agree with him but you know he's putting that out uh, but another uh associate uh another person that i just recently interviewed um is uh john de souza a former fbi agent and he says that he 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 comes up with a different kind of scenario, which is one that, no, it's not going to be a real alien invasion at all. There's not going to be aliens involved at all, but but it's going to be the deep state using uh, holographic technologies and some of its hardware to simulate a an invasion, an alien invasion. So so what do you, you know, where do you stand on all of that? Where I stand is that no one can come through to the star system unauthorized. So um, real alien invasion, it's... No, um, I, this this scenario of real alien invasion just uh, came back to the scene just when it's funny when the the Negumak were starting to think about lying, making alliance with the Federation and a ship coming into the star system. So that was funny. That scared the if the deep state knew about this, it would scare them so much, and they would try to really uh, demonize the the Negumak, like oh. I, ugly harmful aliens are coming that's this so that but you know so as i said no one can come through it's impossible um then um i think um john de souza has the right information uh he has the data he gives is something that the deep state has planned since a long time but then i have also information that the the federation will not let this happen because this will be against the, the whole disclosure plan that they are, they have been preparing the Federation and uh, the, the Solar Warden, the U.S. Navy, the, the, the positive space programs, uh, the Earth Alliance. They, they've, they've, they are working on a soft disclosure, progressive disclosure. So um, a fake alien invasion in that we, we would be stopped. I, I was told that we will not let this happen, but. Um, so that's information I have beside what John uh, brings. Okay, very interesting. So the, the whole project Blue Beam that's been around since uh, the mid or early 1990s, that the deep state prepared for all of that, um, even though they, they still have some technologies and assets and holographic uh, means that they're not going to be allowed to, that the Earth Alliance, the white the military white hats are working with the Galactic Federation mm. to prevent that from, from happening. Because as you say, yes. it'll just it'll just create uh, chaos and a lot of confusion. Yeah. Okay. And and that makes sense. I mean, uh, why why put the why traumatize the public any more than they need to? Because you know, once the truth is coming out, it's going to be traumatizing as it is to learn the, the history of what's been really happening on our planet. Yes, and we have enough to be to be uh, impressed with with all the, the truth that are start that have started to come up out. I mean, we don't need uh, more, uh, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this kind of takes me to the final uh, kind of segment that I want to series of questions I want to focus on, which is uh, the the religious community. I mean, the, the religious mm -hmm. community have have been kind of like pretty brainwashed. Uh, by the negative extraterrestrials, and and some of it is coming out. Uh, you know, now, of course, at the heart of the Judeo-Christian or the Abrahamic faiths is this supreme deity called Yahweh, um, and or Jehovah, or Yaldabrath, and you know, there's there's a lot of debate over exactly who this being is. Is it as the some Christians, some Muslims, some Jews believe this 
all-powerful God that stands above all of the other gods or ETs? Or is it just one ET imposter pretending to be an all-powerful God, fooling the, the religious community into believing that he is this all-powerful being, but yet all he is is just one among many different extraterrestrials, that he's none other than Enlil or maybe Marduk. So you want to maybe talk about that? Yes, thank you, Michael. That's a, a very important topic. They, they, the God of the ancient Testament, uh, Yahweh, was a bloodthirsty evil entity. Uh, he was called the master of war. Um, and there are many texts that um, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I know Bible scholars who uh, have researched this topic and are very good at just saying the same thing um, with corrobor corroborating ancient texts. Yahweh was uh, an Anunnaki god, and from my information, he was Enlil. Enlil, en, en, ne, en, Enlil, Nelil means the master of the commander, the master of war as well. And we know that he was reptilian. He was, uh, he had no empathy, and he totally fits the god of the ancient testament. And he. His, his aim was to keep humanity enslaved and arguing with each other. He was constantly asking everybody to bash each other, to kill each other, slaughter each other. To He, he wanted to... There's an episode in the Ancient Testament where Yahweh asked young virgin girls 32 for himself. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, it's not the God of love. You know, it's, it's nothing to do with that. It was, it was, it wasn't the God. The notion of God, in fact, it's something that humans put on uh, extraterrestrials who, um, who were almighty and wanted to be worshipped. There's also the notion of God, which is an archetype or, or an egregore for the, an environment that humans didn't understand. But in the case of Yahweh, it was a real person, a real extraterrestrial. And he was uh, really, uh, really evil and playing out. And his uh, opponent was Enki, tried to help humanity, tried to, 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 to you know, save the, the damages. And Yeshua was uh, an envoy from Enki. Um, and he had um, engineered with his scientist and this activated uh, bloodline with Adam or Adapa and this um, royal, in, in a way, bloodline of activated humans, activated humans, that means we have all in ourselves these abilities. Yeshua was saying, everything I can do, you can do too. He, Yeshua was sent at a moment where the Roman Empire was taking so much power and everything was really going really bad and Yahweh was, the, was, was really taking power and Lil. So Yeshua was sent to turn the population against Yahweh and tell them he's not, the real, he's not a real God. You have the kingdom of, of God within yourself and by teaching them love and compassion and you know. Uh, uh, it ended bad for him. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so yeah, Yahweh was was an evil entity. So the Christians may be, um, these truths are coming out. And I'm not the only one to, 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 to say this. There are people who study really the text and really can prove it with the text. Um, the Christians may be a, a bit lost learning about that. But it's, because when they learn that the Roman Empire has just shifted into the Holy Roman Empire, it's still the same people, okay? There was this, this religion growing, so they assimilated it and took it as a tool of power. The institution is evil. The institution of the, the Vatican is evil based on evil entities, a evil reptilian entities, Sikar and reptilian Anunnaki. They are which are gone now, but the institution is crumbling down, but still has some power. And 
the Christians are going to be faced with this, are starting to be faced with this truth, are coming out, but it's very, there's a solution, there's a way. The Christians, what, what do they want? They want to, to uh, honor um, an entity of love and fraternity and etc. Well, that's that's the, the the creator source. That's the the source of creation. That's not a god. It's a source of consciousness of energy. And uh, Yeshua or Jesus w w was coming to send to say that. So if people just stay Christians, but just shift to, just stick to what Yeshua was teaching people and Yeshua's teachings. It's still Christianity and it's the real Christianity. It's all about love, helping each other and et cetera, et cetera. And, and having co direct connection with creator source. Jesus never spoke about uh, churches or priests. No, he fought the priest. He fought the priest. He fought them. When he was judged, uh, Pons Pilate, he said he didn't want to crucify uh, Yeshua, but it's the, 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 the priest, the, 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 the priest of Yahweh, they said, you need to crucify this, this, this man because he's saying bullshit. And the real, the real power, God, it's Yahweh and it's the Roman Empire, it's the Roman Emperor. So you need to get rid of this guy who's just annoying everyone. That's what happened. When people realize this truth, wow, that, that's a big change. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's going to be part of, of the revelation. And uh, I, it's worth pointing out, I, I agree with what you said about the Catholic Church uh, being taken over by reptilians er, very early on. And it goes back, you know, back to the, th uh, to the early period of Christianity because a lot of people don't know that, you know, now people think there are, you know, there are four Gospels in the Bible, in the New Testament, uh, Matthew, Luke, uh, John, and um, Matthew, Luke, John, and there's a, there's a fourth one that, that escapes me at the moment, Mark. So the, the four Gospels, but there were actually another four Gospels. There were, there were eight to begin with, and the other four were the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas, and the Gospel of Truth. And these were, they, there were eight Gospels circulating at the time, and the, gospel, the, the latter four Gospels of uh, of Thomas, of Philip, of Luke, they they were giving a very different picture of Christianity, of mm. Jesus, and they they actually described that Jesus was emphasizing the light within, that that he was advocating that his followers learn to embrace the light within, that he was there to help people connect with that inner light, exactly. and what the and what and what the Catholic Church did was that they, uh, with the help of the Roman Empire, they they had the other four Gospels that talked about uh, Jesus encouraging his followers to find the light within. That women were actually equals to men in the in the journey. That that Mary was actually uh, the, one of the was was the leading apostle. It wasn't wasn't Peter? Peter wasn't the leading apostle. It was actually Mary Mary Magdalene. Was yes. the one that had the that had the deepest understanding of Jesus's teachings. That's very clear in the Gospel of Philip, but that was all suppressed because when the Roman Empire decided to convert to Christianity, they were interested in power and hierarchy, and they said, "Well, how do we do this?" So they talked to the leading Christian bishops, and they came up with this scheme and said, "Okay, we want you to create a hierarchy where you have at the top a pope, bishops." priests and then the people and um you know and you will have all, everything you need to make that happen and so the orthodox christians suppressed all knowledge of these other four gospels and mm -hmm. suppressed all the historical memory of the gnostics and it was only up until 1945 with the discovery at, at naj hamadi when the gnostic texts were discovered that all of this came out. And so this has been suppressed. Even now they're suppressing this. But I think this is going to come out. And and in the four suppressed Gnostic Gospels, it's very clear Jesus taught everyone to find the light within because together that light within is part of this universal light, which is God, which is the Father. And that this being that calls himself God uh, Yahweh was in fact the demiurge. He's a pretender. That's actually part of the Gnostic teachings. So yeah, I, I totally agree that this is going to be 
a, a real watershed for uh, Christians around the world. And uh, I assume that Jews and Muslims will go through their own process because, yeah, the truth has been suppressed for such a long time. Yes, and it's it's not a faith crumbling down. It, it, they must not see that like this. They must see like an a, an institution who has a lie to people to manipulate them is crumbling down. But the the the, the faith remain in the in the good things, in the love, finding the the, the connection, the Creator inside, uh, within ourselves. Go back to the the teaching of of Yeshua for the Christians. And uh, there were uh, these groups of extraterrestrials, were Nunaki. They, they, they were the protagonists. You had Enlil playing Yahweh. Sometimes they were swapping, but most of the time it was this: Enlil playing Yahweh, Marduk playing Satan, and um, Ninurta playing uh, Allah. Um, yeah, in other times I would be burned for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, but um, the and uh, and he was there as well, and he he was the one who told um, 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 what's his name Noah um, to to build the, the to build the ark and save you know, and because Noah was the the carrier of the the bloodline of activated people, and he was behind the scene always trying to to save the the, the activated people that this genetic uh, strand stays in the population and multiply and spreads out and the, the humans you know it's like uh, Enki installed an antivirus in the population you know with activated DNA then people who are the descendants of this bloodline a lot of people now uh, have activated powers especially healing and uh, you know paranormal powers and that's how we, we are normally when we are activated. So uh, it was a good move. So when we come to this idea, which is kind of like at the core of a, a lot of evangelical Christians, which is the, the return of Jesus, with, with the emergence of the cedars, with the rise of the space arcs, with the return of Enki or Prince Ia, with the return of Jesus, how does that figure out? Uh, how does that kind of figure? Are, are we talking about a real historical being, Jesus returning, or are we talking about the teachings that mm. that he promoted and that that's what's returning? Michael, uh, I'm so glad you said it because I, I I share totally this 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 thing. Jesus is not returning as himself or as a being it's his the frequency of his bloodline it's his his spirit his his teachings as you said it's totally it um now we are in the time where the the institution the catholic institution is crumbling down and with it all the other fake institution based on enslavement of the population by ignorance and submission uh, and when that crumbles, th there's the renaissance of this faith in human, faith in who we are, and faith in the connection directly with, we can call it God or creator or source, because we are a fractal of it. And that is what I am really fighting to, to, to tell everyone. Yes, we are made at the image of the creator, not the bodies, people, <laughs> the soul. We are fractals. The consciousness is a fractal of source. And we are, as a fractal of source, we have the quantum entanglement to create a source. And just by meditation and just centering our thoughts into who we are and our own frequency, we have direct line with God. We don't need um, um, churches, institution. Institution, what is it? It's power control fear pressure i mean to tell uh, a, a baby or that the baby is born with sin what what's wrong with you people you know <laughs> that's, that's not right so it's we are coming back to the truth and you know the saying um truth shall set you free but first it needs to shatter your illusions 
that's not enjoyable, but it needs to happen. So to go through this change, go back to the essential, your our direct connection. And if you want to, if the Christians wants to, wish to stay really Christians, let Yeshua, Yeshua, study his material. And, and you know, that that's true Christianity for me. I'm not a Christian, but I would do that anyway. Yes, well, uh, I mean, when you go to the truth, and uh, Yeshua was really a dissident. Uh, Jesus yes. was a dissident. I mean, he was he was persecuted because he wanted to empower people. He wanted people to go within and find the light within, not to give their power away to priests and hierarchy. That's why they that's mm -hmm. why they crucified him. And of course, it's ironic that the church perpetuated that. But but there are those Christians that kept that alive and I, I think this is going to be one of the things that is going to be really amazing for uh, those that follow the Christian teachings that this true knowledge is going to come out and uh, I, I think this disclosure is going to have something in it for everybody. So in finishing up, uh, any webinars? Uh, you, I know you, you just uh, did one uh, at the end of April, when's your next webinar coming up? Uh, I'm going to let a little gap because I'm quite busy at the moment. So the next webinar will be uh, probably the 4th of June. Uh, so I'll keep everyone posted. Um, and uh, I'm still writing books and I'm going to concentrate on really finalizing very well the Stephen Chow Area 51 book. And then I have other projects I conduct at the same time. So um, very busy <laughs> and up and down when it happens. So we never know. We never know. <laughs> so, we very much appreciate the, the updates that you give us for your trips uh, upstairs. And, uh, you know, I just want to tell people uh, the, the webinar that you just did, I, I actually attended. I thought it was a fabulous webinar. So oh, people can still go to your website and they can, yes. still, they can still watch the replay of the, of the webinar. So it's well worth it. Um, and uh, Stephen Chow's book uh, comes out on June 1st. You can pre-order it uh, as of May 8th from uh, Amazon. Uh, details are at elenadanam.org. So, Elena, I want to thank you again for all the work you do. I, I know you kind of like, in, in a way, you're a target for, uh, for, for many deep state assets that don't want this information to come out. So I just want to acknowledge that, you know, people – love what you're doing, they love you, and you know, we wish you the very best in fulfilling your role. You're doing a, a tremendous mission for, for our planet, and, you know, we hold you in our hearts. So, uh, yeah, you, you definitely are on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.